All right, happy Tuesday, everyone. Um, I thought we'd finish off the years we uh, to uh, talk about bad airplane designs. And why would I do that? It's because I think you should appreciate, as you're working in engineering, that some of your ideas are not going to be great. And some of your ideas you're going to get done with and say, how I end up with this? I know I have. But I don't want you to feel bad because there's been a whole organizations that come up with an idea that I think even with your limited airplane experience would know was a bad idea. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Also, let me say, you all have many of the APs. I want you to concentrate on those. I want you to worry about your math and science. I would appreciate it if you'd watch this, but I also want you to do well on those. Okay? So this will be just short videos, not much homework now. I want you to concentrate on your core subjects and so we can come in fresh. I would say is um, next year we're going to plan to do um, activities. So if we're at school every day, great. But if we're not, you're going to be able to make things at home. Much like you made that airplane wing, we're going to do other things as well. Okay? So, you know, we, we as a humanity have designed some beautiful aircraft. Sop with Camel, up at the top left hand, Mustang 51, the Concorde, flew faster than air by the British and French for years, beautiful airplane. And I could go, we could do a whole lecture on just gorgeous airplanes. All right. However, we've had some ones that are just not great. And some of this in the first part of this, we're going to be primarily ones that were left behind. That the designs, you don't move quick enough your design gets left behind, you're out of luck. So this plane was a British airliner, and you're going to hear a theme. There are a lot of defunct British airlines, or people try to design, the British trying to make airliners. And honestly, that's why their, you know, Airbus is left, and it was really a European consortium run by France. Um, but there it is. British airliner was supposed to replace this DC-3. It's called the AL Accountant. And... It was, first of all, they tried to modify another DC-3 and put turboprops and say, okay, we can make an airliner out of this. And they kept changing things. But probably the biggest problem they had is by the time they had two built, they realized they had no facilities to make a fleet of them and the quantities airlines would want them. So, you know, accountants are kind of ironic. <laughs> they account for the fact that you don't have the facilities to build this. All right, this is a Blumann Voss. It's a German, I guess Voss, not Voss, Voss. How they pronounce it, German. Largest flying boat. It had 200 foot wingspan. It was the heaviest aircraft in the world. But, you know, by the time it was so big, it needed a rocket assist launch to take off. You had to stick a rocket on the rear end of the aircraft so it could to launch it, believe it or not. And so, believe it or not, um, it was a sitting duck. So that's probably not good at the end of World War II if you're a German aircraft manufacturer. So a huge airplane, it was a flying boat. Also, you can see a lot of flying boats got left behind. And one of the reasons is because it was cheaper at the, originally to make a flying boat because they didn't have big, long runways. As you get long, big runways, because remember we talked about that, the bigger the airplane, generally the longer the aircraft uh, runway you need, um, they use the ocean. Well, uh, the long end run runways became bigger and bigger. They didn't need flying boats. All right. Again, another flying boat. This is Boeing. They were going to use it during World War II to hunt for submarines from the Japanese. By the time it came out, the war was winding down, but more importantly, they just, with a different strategy of putting, uh, building airstrips and putting them nearby to look for submarines. So that's a common trend. Uh, here's a great design. It got outdated. When it came out, when it first designed, middle of the 30s, not a bad aircraft. <coughs> One little design flaw here, all the machine guns were pointed out of the back of the aircraft. So when the Germans in the beginning dogfights snuck up from behind, 
wow, they got shot at. They weren't expecting that. Normally on an air fighter, the bullets are all coming from the front. So they were really surprised. They thought that unsuspecting. So it did okay then. But very quickly, the Germans realized there's no bullet, there's no bullets, guns pointed towards the front of the pilot. And so uh, they would just fly up straight on and shoot them down. Uh, it served out the war, I guess, as a night fighter. Now, you may say to yourself, Mr. Dubik, why did they have the gunner back there? Because at the time, they thought a pilot couldn't both fly and shoot at the same time. Another British airplane, 230 feet wingspan. Again, today, a, 130, uh, a 737, pretty common airplane, is only 137 foot wingspan. It's a huge airplane. It had so much room, it had its own movie theater. Um, it had five times the space. So just think first class all the way back, even more so. That was the plan. The other problem is it couldn't get the engines. So they designed this whole airplane without really having the power plants in course. So I, I can't stress enough that as you design these things, you have to think about what your limitations are. And they hadn't identified by the time they had turboprops that would kind of half fly it, the jet engine was out, and that was the end of it. That's another reason why you see a lot of British airlines. They had a lot of running starts that ended. Now, there's a person you can ask your parents about, named Howard Hughes, this rich, eccentric guy, was a test pilot, ran airlines, genius, made all this money, but um, suffered a mental collapse over time. Um, but the more important thing is he didn't really listen to his customers. This is the Corvair 880. Again, he liked legroom. He only wanted five seats across. The problem is your customers wanted six seats across. So they built, tested, did everything else, and the plane basically really never got used very much because the airliners said they couldn't make money with it. Listen to, you know, the key is listen to what your customers are telling you. All right. Here's a B-32. B you probably have heard of B-29. It was used throughout World War II, or if you're in airplanes, you might have. Um, you same the same parts, but it just had took too long to develop. It had, even though it had its first test flight first before the B-29, they could never, it kept having problems with engine fires, which, as you can imagine, on a bomber is not what you want to hear. All right. Douglas Devastator is based off of World War I technology, that you're going to fly your airplane low and slow and launch torpedoes. These did sink one aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, almost all of them were destroyed in combat, and they were pulled off the front lines because the pilots were going low and slow, and it's just a not a good combination for a fighter, for any kind of attack aircraft. If you're going to be an attack aircraft, then you better be fast, drop your bombs, get the heck out of there. This was neither. Now, the Mixmaster, and if you're saying to yourself, Mixmaster, Mr. D, does that sound a lot like a uh, uh, appliance I'd find in my kitchen? You bet it would. I used two turboprops on the end here. But if you notice, it's got this sleek body and thin wings that you would associate with a jet aircraft. And that's what it was trying to do. Jet Air, the technology, they were already the pilots, the designers were already saying you need thin wings, slow, slow, streamlined body to be able to go faster than the speed of sound. We've got a bunch of turboprops, let's use them. Uh, unfortunately, for this aircraft, jet engines came out, there was no real reason to use it anymore. So sometimes it's engineering, you just don't have it. Now, This is another thing. This plane came out, the Ferry Battle, and I may be saying it wrong, all right? Ferry Battle. Um, 1932, it was leading edge technology. It used metal skin and closed cockpit, very streamlined. Unfortunately, by the time the war started, it wasn't so much. And again, two people in the aircraft thinking that the pilot can't do everything. Uh, the British also were famous. Navy was very much saying you needed a navigator to fly back. They had their doubts one person could do it. Uh, unfortunately, almost all the pilots who flew, these were killed. 
See, it's one thing to have a bad design. It's an, uh, for a civilian airplane, your business goes, you know, you might go out of business, people might get laid off. And in wars, if you don't have a plane that's current, the enemy is going to shoot them down. And here's another one. And again, same issue. Two people in the plane, slow arming it, got shot down. Not so great. Again, 1930s technology and the 1940 wars. Now this one is just plain ugly. It's called the Farman Jabiru. Farman Jabiru. Uh, four engines for nine passengers. Then a puller engine and a pusher engine. All right. And on each side, it's just ugly aircraft all the way around. The nose was hideous. Um, not sure what to say other than if it doesn't look good, that's usually not a very good sign on an aircraft. And if you're running four engines, you're running a lot of fuel and with only nine employee nine paid passengers and you you know and you're paying two staff members on the aircraft, you got some issues. Now this one's an interesting one and this one was designed to track ships at night. It's general aircraft fleet General Aircraft Fleet Shower called U.S. Air Force thing. Um, I'm, I actually take that scratch. That was the name, I believe. Designed to fly ships at night. The tiny engines were kept. To, uh, these has tiny engines on it. Were kept. Were, were kept to keep noise down. They use small engines to keep the noise down. The flaps go through the whole length of the wing. If you remember our 172s, the flaps just part of the wing went all the way across, so you could fly it really, really slowly. That way, you could track a ship, and the ship wouldn't hear you. And therefore couldn't shoot you down. Uh, you know, th this idea all had merit until we developed radar, and that was the end of that. This is a case where you have a fast airplane, Republic F X 12 Rainbow aircraft. Awesome. Big engine, sleek, really could go fast. People thought they'd pay for a premium. Sadly, they would not. It was after World War II. People don't realize we went into a pretty robust recession right after World War II because you had all these people coming back from the war. All these factories were making things for the war. We're no longer making things people wanted. And so that leads to a real downturn. Well, that downturn occurred when this aircraft was coming out and none of the airliners wanted it. Uh, this is actually a well-designed aircraft. It was the BE-2. Was used in World War Two, World War One, excuse me, because at the beginning of the war they just used airplanes to scout what the other enemy is doing, and so you just want a good, stable airplane. The person could fly it, see what they see, and came back. Problem is, it wasn't too long into the war we started having air combat. So when the Brit flew over there, and it might have been a Brit or German, someone in one of the pilots decided, "Hey, I'm going to take a handgun with me. If I see somebody else, I'm going to shoot them." And Next thing you know, we'll put a machine gun on there. The next thing we know, we have air combat. Now, in case you're wondering why I have all these war combat aircraft, we see the greatest, during wars, the greatest evolution very, very quick. And you see the greatest amount of changes. Because think of the war, think of the aircraft. If the Bright Brothers are flying 1903, look at the, the difference of the aircraft by the beginning of the war, the end of the war, by the 1920s. It's just a huge, just huge evolution. Okay, what do you do when you see a plane that was very popular, especially before the world, DC-3, seeing that you see them all in the old movies, and you decide to clone it? And that's fine. We copy ideas. That's the greatest form of uh, compliment. Problem is, you don't copy it in the 1960s for an aircraft that was kind of outdated by the end of the war, World War II, certainly by afterwards, 20 years later. So it was a San, a San a Saab Scandia. It's just a DC-3. They were trying to put turboprop engines on. Learned, used in Brazil for a little while. They flew these until like the late 60s. There only a couple, three of them. Hey, what do you do when you're good at making British flying boats? Well, the British were. So they kept trying to make them. And that's an elegant looking. I'll give them that. The plane, it doesn't look bad. It looks kind of neat, actually. Problem is... By the time this plane, this comes out in 1952, there's no need for flying boats anymore. Now, this is a British anti-submarine aircraft. 
and you start to do to designing your design specs, a lot of times you start thinking about, well, I'm going to be on an aircraft carrier. I need to be small, and rugged, and and but then you start forgetting that it needs to be able to fly well. And this was called, the people that flew, saw it, described it, said a camel, you know, among racehorses when you put it to the other airplanes. It was terribly hard to fly. The only person that could fly reasonably well was the top test pilot, and he got killed flying it. Okay, sometimes there's one design spec that will set everything back. The Brits wanted a heavy bomber. That's great big bombers that you think of, like we've been seeing, B-27s. But they required the wingspan couldn't be more than 100 feet. Mr. Dubik, why couldn't the wingspan be more than 100 feet? Because they were building, um, where they were going to store the aircraft, the, the doors would only open 100 feet. And so they wanted to make the airplane fit the doors. And if you think about it, that's really quite dumb. You could make bigger storage facilities a lot cheaper than developing aircraft. All right. So because of the shorter wingspans, it's heavier. It's not generating enough lift, so you can't go so high. Well, if you can't go so high, you're going to fly. It could fly right through the flak. It couldn't fly over the flak. So the anti-aircraft just pounded these pilots in them. Not good for a bomber. Um, This was delayed. I'm just really picking this out because I think it's an ugly look in the nose of this airplane right down there. It just looks ugly. It's called a short sturgeon. It was a submarine aircraft and it wasn't a submarine aircraft and it was. By the time they settled on what it was, the war was over. So they make a lot of them. All right, triplane, it was long, thin wings. It was meant to go after blimps, zeppelins. That was really the scourge of over, over London because of the way these wings were settled. And then they called it an ad box at the time. It never really could turn around. It also, it just... It was not clumsy for flying. It was very clumsy to fly, and it really was hard to aim, even at a big Zeppelin. The good news is this Sopwith led to this Sopwith LRTTR, led to the Sopwith Camel. That's the first plane we saw, which was a remarkable plane for the war. Okay, now the last airplanes we saw there were airplanes that might not have been poorly designed, just ran out of time, right? These, on the other hand, are just bad ideas. This does not look like it's going to fly very well. This was, uh, this, I think, Senecaba, which I can't say properly. Uh, flying wheel. This is a French aircraft uh, flying ring. It, Believe it or not, this is the wrapped wing. And the idea was that this was going to be able to fly a vertical takeoff plane. You're going to keep saying, we like the idea of vertical takeoff planes. It, Uses a lot less space. This looks like an air duct for like the beginning of a jet engine. That's actually a wing. The pilot had to be rotated on it. Plus, the pilot had to had to look over his shoulder to land the aircraft. This was not ever going to be a great deal. The, the, the believe it or not, the seat inside of it rotated so you'd have a more natural position in the aircraft. Flown a couple times and then abandoned. Hey. What's a great idea to land on an enemy beach, hoard a heavily fortified beach? Well, let's make gliders out of lumber, and we'll put the Marines on there, and we'll land this on the beach. Mm, you know, the glider flew, but I'm not sure I want to do on a heavily fortified position flying a wooden glider. This is an idea that actually flew apparently well. But just, if you think through it, it, isn't a great idea. That is, stick wings on a tank, and you get the Anatov KT flying tank. The idea was, it was World War II, let's get tanks to the partisans that are behind the Germans so they can hinder the Germans. That was the, what the uh, Russians at the time were thinking. That if we could drop in tanks, the locals there could get in said tanks and attack the Germans. 
Yeah. If you can find a plane that can tow this well, and are you going to be flying said plane, towing said tank glider behind enemy lines? How safe is that going to be? I will say it's kind of cool that it actually flew and it actually landed. I will also say the plane that tried to tow it, the engine caught on fire because it was so overheated from trying to drag this thing around. Now here's one. <laughs> you know what? I've got an idea. I want World War I, my gunners, to be able to see. So I'm going to put these nacelles. These are like little fuselages here and here. The pot, these, There's going to be a pot, gunner here, a gunner there. They're going to have clear, unobstructed view. Awesome idea. Let's go attack the enemy. Problem is, we've now blocked the view of the pilots. Also, why is this third wing? There's a one wing here, down here, and this third wing's out farther than the other two. Why did they do that? Sadly, that we'll never know. Now, this is why we keep, one of the reasons we keep thinking there's UFOs, because we keep trying to make things that look like UFOs. This was a very, actually, it was a Canadian who came up with the design. It's actually quite unstable. All right. And it could use ground effects. It could be three feet off the ground, but that was it. So it's uh, it was quite an aircraft, not a very good aircraft. And uh, if we first did it in Canada, the United States looked at it. Again, they wanted vertical takeoff. Again, it could use ground effect. It could go across the ground at you know, 30, 40 miles an hour underneath it. It's not really helpful. All right. Hey, it's the end of the war. We're running out of materials. Time to get creative. So what did the Germans come up with a natter? That was idea was, it was basically a jet. Or like a rocket jet. And that you were going to take said rocket, launch it vertical, launch your your rockets off the vertical rocket, and then parachute out, and the plane would come back down as a parachute as well. The idea that you would um, be able to launch it straight up, hit the missiles, and jump off. It never really got off the ground as the war ended, luckily. Hey, what do you do with an unstable? Because look at where the pilot's sitting up there. That you know, it's going to want to tilt. We got all kinds of things. And slow aircraft. Oh, you land this thing on an aircraft carrier. That seems like a good plan. It never made it. Thank goodness. Now. Here's another, same company, they came out with, well, okay, that one doesn't work, got a better idea. We're going to take off, we're going to make it so the landing gear will fall off, and then we can shoot a torpedo out of it. And then the pilot can, the uh, instruct pilot can ditch this at sea, which will recover it. Think about that a little bit. So you're going to drop the landing gear, then bring the plane down the water, launch your torpedo, fly back, and just dump it in the ocean every time. How does that one even get out of committee? This one, because, hey, we can't. Another Blackburn one. See this? Those are two fuselages there. It's like two complete planes. We've merged them together. When you comply two float planes, there's what you get. Um, it was The idea was this was designed simply to be come off of aircraft carriers to attack or float planes, excuse me, it'd been a float plane when an aircraft carrier, to attack zeppelins and they would attack big heavy metal burning uh like darts to drop in the zeppelins to work. It had no guns, by the way. So if it ran an enemy aircraft, it was in trouble. I don't think it's so much use. Alright. Okay, so what do we do? Back to Germans again. It's the end of the war. We're running, and in fairness to them at that point, the, the, but I'm glad, by the way, the, America, the Allies had destroyed their ability to make metal, oil. They're all in short supplies. What's never in short supplies? Trees, basically, and cloth. So they decided to make a glider. And the idea on this strategy was we'll have combat aircraft drag these gliders up, and newbie fly pilots, they don't have to worry about power now, 
they'll pilot this and shoot missiles at the bombers. Some ideas are good. Let's use materials we have. Gliders? and eh, pilots don't need as much experience. Don't use fuel. Wait a minute. You got to tow the thing up, so you're still using fuel. And you're wasting your, some fighter pilots that you basically have as they're towing these guys behind them. And an unexperienced pilot, that's probably going to get them both killed. All right. Now, you may say to your friends, I have a better idea. And they may tell you, no, you don't. And you may say, no, I think it's a really good idea. And they tell you, mm, not so much. And then if you're in the South, you say, hey, hold on, watch this. Well, same thing with this fellow, an American designer. He thought the key to flight, and this is in the late 20s. I get this in the 1900s because we we're still learning. So 1905, get this argument. By 1928, it's been 24 years. He thought they should be like a, as close to a bird as possible. So he spent four years, a lot of money, a lot of the time in wind tunnels designing the Bonnie Gull. And it's got this we're, we're a bird like wing on it. Looks like a bird. Uh, his family said, please don't fly this thing. The observer said, that thing is not going to fly safely. He took it out to show them they were wrong. Sadly, they were right. It crashed on the first flight, killing him, which is not funny, but, you know, family and friends tell you it's probably not a good deal. There's often a good reason why they're telling that. Hey, what do you do? It's the end of World War I. You want a big bomber, but you make a really large one that's way oversized to begin with. It's ungainly. It doesn't turn. Ah, let's add steam engines. <laughs> they put steam engines on this, which would even add more weight, which is, I'm not sure how they thought. The, they never did the energy calculations on that. So in any case, none were ever flown. Thank goodness. They just it got too heavy. But using a steam engine, I want. Now this one, nine wings, because there's three triplane, triplane, triplane. Nine wings, eight engines, eight engines, folks. What could possibly go wrong? This had a wingspan twice that of a B-52 bomber by today's size. It was huge. Super cluttery, all these strings. It was the idea it was going to fly across from Europe to U.S. nonstop. There's no way in the world anybody with half a brain would get in that aircraft. See all the wires trying to hold everything together. You've got to have not. You got to have eight engines all working right at the same time. Yikes! Oh, here's another idea. We got big super fortress type bombers out there, and we have nuclear power plants. There's a match made in heaven. So they seriously, this bomber used a small little nuclear reactor as a way of piloting it around. They, they actually had a, a phone that the president would be identified if one of these crashed because it would have given off nuclear radiation. It, would have, it could have been, looked like a mushroom cloud. Yikes. Now... Let me just describe this airplane part. Another vertical takeoff, another one going off the Navy. You can see Navy on it. The pilot had to get in a ladder to climb into the thing. It had casters. Casters are what are under your chair when you slide around. It's how you move around. You've got chairs that roll around. Those little wheels on the bottom of the show, those are called casters. And yes, if you're looking, those are casters on the end of these things. And this is on an aircraft carrier. Do I really need to say anything more? Well, another fairy, because they just can't come up with uninteresting designs. In this case, it used a tractor engine. That's not the problem, but it used little jet engines on each of the wingtips of this plane. So it was so loud, you couldn't land it in an airport. The military didn't want it. The civilian didn't want it. Now, it's the end of the war. We've tried launching pilots. You're going to jump off. Let's not even bother with that. Let's put explosives in the front of this thing, right up there. And we're just going to launch our pilot up. And we're going to tell the pilot, right before you hit the enemy, jump out of the aircraft. Luckily, um, 
it was really not even used. Even even the, at the, at the end, they realized that was just a suicide mission. Again, you know, not picking on them for going with wood and and uh, cloth because they were running out of materials, but they had to use a special glue. The Allies blew up the glue factory, so they used a cheaper glue. Now it's quite a good glue. Well, when that happened, the planes had literally disintegrated in midair. So uh, they never really used this very often. Again, the Nazis kind of glad they did. So, and believe it or not, folks, I actually have hundreds of, you know, hundreds of, like, tens, many, many more bad designs out there. But that will do it for today. Really want you to concentrate on your APs. I want you to get ready for your math and English, and so you guys do well on those exams. Have yourself a great day. There is no, you just, please just watch this video. That's all you needed to do for today.